Hi everybody, I'm Christian. Welcome to Lazy Devs. Welcome to our tutorial. I'm, I'm warming up a little bit. Well, um, this is our roguelike tutorial where we're making a roguelike in Pico 8, a bit more advanced tutorial. Um, and things are, 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 are going swell. We have a character, he's moving a bit slow. Not love how slow this character moves, but you know we kind of like have this character. He's running around, and um, we can start working on this a little bit. Last time around, I told uh, you guys um, something about I don't like how how we're starting to code this. I don't like this part. This is again because we're um, this is a bit of an advanced tutorial, and we are actually thinking about you know how to squeeze a big game into a, a Pico 8 card. So something I want to be doing today is I want to be optimizing this function a little bit so it's a little bit more smoother, uh, takes a little bit less less uh, tokens. Because again, down here, that's that's the big enemy. That's our big big boss of, of Pico 8. Um, Pico 8 doesn't allow you to have more than 8,192 tokens. What is a token? Well, um, <laughs> it's kind of hard to tell, but basically every command, everything that you draw, like every like piece of code, not necessarily how many characters you wrote in, but every operation, every function takes away, chops away at this at this token limit. So, for example, if I remove this equation sign, you see we the equation sign is worth two tokens, right? Or this minus is actually worth a token. So every time we type something, we do an operation with something, we lose tokens. And um, I mean, generally token optimization is something that you start doing when you hit the limit. But I think it's worthwhile uh, acquiring some practices, some like things, some, um, some philosophies, some strategies that um, from the get go, so you don't have to like waste time redoing your code. And also, I think today we're going to look at a technique which I, I, I really enjoy. I think it's a really good technique. <clears throat> because this here, this kind of situation, is something that you see in every game over and over again. And it always drives me crazy a little bit um, myself uh, until I found like this technique here. Because like, you know, this four if statements and they all do basically the same. They all change the same variables, but just by different amounts depending on which button was pressed, right? So this is programming and programming should like every time you do something, repeat something, um, there should be like a warning message in your, like a warning light in your head. It should go like, bing. it will go like, maybe there's a way of automate this a little bit. And there is a way of automating this. I think it's a good idea to create an array that kind of like associates directions with coordinates. So we're gonna call this way for, let's call this way x, or let's call it maybe dear x. Let's call it dear x, dear x and dear y. So this is gonna be an array, and this array will, each of the directions that we on the, are on the buttons, we're gonna be associated with how much you subtract or add in the x value. So for example, um, let, me, let me look through, let me show you this real quick. If you look at this, so when you go left, we subtract one from x, right? So we're gonna just like, okay, left is minus one, right is plus one, and then up is zero, down is zero. So we can like save all of the things that we subtract and add to the variables to move left, right, up, down. Um, we're gonna save them in, a, in like a, in an array. So we can just use this array as a reference instead of having to type it down every, every time. And you know, y is gonna be, it's gonna be like this. Um, couple of things here. So first the sequence that we're using, left, right, up, down. Uh, we're gonna use the same sequence that Pico 8 is using. So Pico 8, the first button, button zero is left, button right is one, button up is two, and button down is three, right? Um, there is a bit of a problem though, because the button sequence in Pico 8 starts at zero, and arrays like this start at one in Lua. So we kind of like have to watch out that we always add plus one if we reference this array, because otherwise we get a bit of a problem. So now we can kind of can associate with button with a change 
of um, of variables in this from this array. That's really useful. Let me show you what I mean. So here, this this entire thing, we can do something like this. <clears throat> We can now use a for next loop, something like for i equals um, 1 to 4, or actually 0 to 3, do end. And we're going to go if btnp, if the button i, button i was pressed, then end. <clears throat> we're going to go p underscore x plus equals and now we're going to reference our array we're going to we're going to make like a instead of like checking each button individually we're going to use a for next loop to loop through all of the buttons and and do all of the changes if one of the button was pressed so um dear x square brackets i and then again because we start at zero so everything is shifted by one plus one and then the same thing with y <clears throat> and then we're going to do the update function now and then return because you know if one button was pressed then we don't have to check the other buttons we don't we can actually go diagonally in this game that's generally by the way a huge gameplay thing i forgot to talk about yeah so in most roguelikes you use like the numpad to so you can also go diagonally but in pico 8 that's not really great because it's sometimes it's difficult to press two buttons at the same time reliably, right? You can press one and then maybe the other one comes in, you know, two couple of frames later. And so we could like try to add the system maybe to make it work, but actually I think it's better to kind of like, okay, we're not going to try to work against the system that we are developing at. Our system doesn't have diagonal, really good diagonal movement, therefore we actually cannot work diagonally. We can always go just in four directions. Okay, so now we can just remove all of this. And now everything works. Ah, there's a bit of one, one, one problem. We can now move around, but of course the animation is not working. So we also have to add the animation. But you know, that's also very easy. We're gonna go POX equals and then we can use the same, the same array to, to pull this off. So something like this. All right, something like this. So we have like y and y here. And we divide it by eight. Um, because, you know, um, this, the, this array just stay, stores minus one plus one just stores basically you know the sign basically or basically s saves how far we move if we press a button in tile coordinates but now we have to kind of like convert those tile coordinates into um into pixel coordinates that, that's far, why we have to multiply by eight um it has to be minus because we kind of like we're offsetting it so you can see now it's moving oh. Easy peasy for breeze. <clears throat> now, this is one part of this. Actually, I'm not, I'm not sure if we actually saved a lot of tokens here, but you know, we're gonna save a lot of tokens down the line. There's also some, some uh, there we could fix. Um, we're gonna actually, we, we might actually optimize it right away because um, there's, that's a bit of a, hmm. Let's go local dx dy. Let's go local dx. And we're going to grab this and save it in a local variable. Because every time you use the square brackets, um, that costs a lot of tokens. So we can, uh, let's just, first let's going to see if we're going to actually save tokens this way. So we're going to go 233. This is uh, how many tokens we have right now. We're going to try to get this number down a little bit. So we can go dx equals, and we're going to copy this guy out and put it in a variable. And now we can replace this with just dx. And equally, we can replace this with just dx. So we don't have too many, you don't have the square brackets twice. And we can also do the same thing with dy. And then we can replace this with dy. And we actually save two tokens that way. <laughs> That's not a lot, but hey, every, every token counts. 
I could even save a little bit more tokens. And that's something I want to maybe explain. So when you define variables like this, when you go local and define a variable, or generally when you do assignment of variable, when you can go x equals four and y equals eight and so forth four like this, you could put those assignments all in one line. That's something that Lua does. That's really unique to Lua. So when you have like these two lines, you can combine them together going, go, going x comma y equals three comma eight. And what it does here is it assigns, you know, it, it goes through all of these variables on the left side of the equation and goes from, you know, the first one gets the first one value after the equation. The second one gets the second after the equation and so forth. So X will get the three, Y will get the eight. And if you had like a Z, it will get the 12 and so forth. If there is, if you run out of values, if the, you know, if it's not symmetrical, something like, you know, you here, there is no fourth value here currently. In this case, you will be assigned nil, just basically as if you had something like nil here. But you might still might do something like this. Um, in, if you want like define local variables that you can use later down the line. Now, the reason why we do this, first of all, is get a bit more compact, especially if you like a huge row of variables like here, you can just put them all into one line. Sometimes it's a bit easier to read. Sometimes it's not really easier to read. But in this case, we're going to save a bunch of, a uh, bit, bit of a token. So we are currently at 200, 231. And if you put this together into one line, like this, now it's, we saved one token like this. And generally, Mm. In the long term, um, that's uh, always like a very simple way of getting tokens back if you like are closely at the limit, is going through your code and seeing when you define variables and merging them into one line. Now, I don't like doing this and generally I will avoiding this kind of technique and unless it's like something like here where it's like, you know, this like two variables X and Y and they're basically both the same and so I like, I'm gonna merge them into one line. But I'm not gonna use, because you know, if you push it to the extreme, especially in an init function, you know, where you define a bunch of stuff, you can put all of the variables in your entire program into one line. And that's like impossible to, to parse. Like you cannot read this. And remember the goal of this project is for you to be able to like hack this and change it and, and redefine it and, 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 and do stuff like that. So I'm gonna actually self-imposed restrictions. I'm not gonna actually use this to save a lot of tokens. It's fine in the program like this, because again, it's not a very long line and you kind of forget what you, what, what's happening, but uh, I'm not gonna overdo it. And something that you keep in mind is like, look at here, um, this plus equals thing, where you increment a variable or reduce a variable by a certain amount, that doesn't work with that. So you cannot do like px and py plus equals dx and dy. That doesn't work. I think at least it doesn't work. Yeah. See, it, it does something crazy. So something to keep in mind. <clears throat> You have to actually, if you have something like this, you do, you do, you know, if you're using the increments, you actually have to, you have to um, put them in individual lines. But here you, we can use this at technique. Here is something we can use. Oh, we might, we might. Probably this part of the program will probably change later on after all. Okay. So. Again, so this is like a very cool trick and we're gonna use some other tricks like this. Generally, we're gonna try every time we have like an if statement that checks for a lot of things, we're gonna try to use some kind of way of putting the data that we're actually changing into an array and just looping through an array instead of doing like this huge um, cascade of if statements. You want to try to avoid the cascades of if, if statements. And you can see that these th these little um, arrays here, we were gonna use them for a lot of different things. They, they, it's actually surprising how, how many things you can use those variables for. For example, something you can do here is if you wanna check for the neighboring tiles, you can also just like, instead of like doing like if statements, like if the tile above is also free and a the tile there is free, you can just like, quickly uh, loop through this uh, through this array and check all of the um, neighboring tiles uh, uh, you, um, executing the same code on on the sequence of, of neighboring tiles. Again, something that we're gonna look in later. 
Right, so here you can see us um, doing the button stuff with a for next loop, which is great. Now we have this part here, which also is a lot of if statements. And again, that's the moment where, you know, your light should should flash and be like, nah, this is not good. <clears throat> so um, there's different ways of solving this. Um, I'm going to actually step right away into, into how I want to actually this animation system to work, which is I'm going to actually rewrite it a little bit. So, um, and again, that's, again, I, you know, we're going to like scaffold this a little bit. We're going to start with a simpler version and we're going to make, try to make them complicated as we go or more complicated as we go. So um, I'm going to introduce a new variable called P underscore T. And that's going to be like a timer, basically a timer that runs and that controls um, the animation after we execute it. So the timer will always start at zero and go to one. And when it reaches one, the animation should be over. And that way we can plug whatever animation we want uh, and control it with the same kind of timer. Uh, in this case, it's going to be like a very simple thing. So, um, so, so yeah, in when we're updating the p-turn, I'm just going to delete all of this. Bam. And we're going to go like um, pt plus equals 0 0.1. We're going to add something to pt. Um, actually, no, we're going to go pt equals um, min 0 0.11. 1. I'm going to explain what this means right away. So this is something I also really like. I, I kind of like grew fond of. So the min, there's min, there's max, and there's mid. These are all three functions that take a bunch of numbers and pick a, one of those numbers from them. So the min function will take two numbers, one and two in our case here, could be different numbers, and will return the slower the lower number from that so in this case one and two it will return the one it's a good way of, of you know choosing which number is slower and, and, and the bigger same thing with a max function max function will return the bigger number so in case of uh, three and four it will return four because four is bigger than three and then finally we have the mid function the mid function returns the middle number funny enough so like in three four and five it will return four because it's in between three and five like number wise if it was three three five it will return obviously three because there is no middle number so there's just lower number so it will return one of the lower numbers <clears throat> but these are really useful functions for a lot of game related stuff so in our case is we want the timer our, our animation timer run from zero to one like using comma numbers from zero to one but we want don't want it to go over one so if it reaches, like if it goes 1.1, it should get like um, cropped down to one. And we use the min function for that. So, you know, if, um, if um, the timer is below one, the min, the min function will pick this as, as, um, as the value for timer. But as soon as p uh, underscore t plus 0 0.1 is bigger than one, it will, would it would overflow our timer would overflow the min function will return one then because then one becomes smaller than the timer and so our timer gets reset so this will advance our timer but reset it down to one and then we go, that way we can know okay if pt equals uh, one then in this case update game we're going to return to update game <clears throat> So this case we don't have to really see you know where the offsets are and if the offsets are in the right positions. We have just one variable that controls the speed of the animation or the, <clears throat> the progress of the animation. So all that we have to do now is we have to actually change the offsets depending on this timer. And you know, that's again, that's kind of like really easy to do. You're gonna go p.ox, that's our offset, equals p underscore ox multiplied by p underscore t actually one minus p underscore t. That's a weird equation, but that actually works. Actually, mm, yeah, it will work, but it will look a bit weird. But I'm gonna look at this in a second here. Um, 
Yeah, so maybe first of all, one minus PT. So again, at the beginning of the animation, it's like, you know, zero. Let's, let me walk you through this. Zero, then, you know, in the middle of the animation is 0 0.5, and at the end is one, right? So this is gonna be like the, and you know, all this numbers in between 0 0.7, five, and so forth. And this is gonna be like the sequence of, you know, frames where each each of each next frame this timer pt becomes bigger and bigger until it reaches one so with one minus pt we kind of re reverse the animation we're gonna go like one um 0 0.5 again in the middle and then you know one at the end uh, zero at the end and then we multiply our offset with that so at the end of the animation we will multiply with zero reducing the offset to to zero that's what we want we want the offset to return to zero regardless of where it started. If we do this, it will kind of work, but some, oh yeah, this is something very important that we have to also do here when we, before we start the animation, we have to reset the timer down to zero. So you see it works, but it's not linear now. It's kind of like he starts moving fast and then kind of like eases into it. And you know, that's because we kind of like we're always taking the results of the previous frame and multiplying it even further. So it's kind of like it creates a curve, not a linear movement. We kind of want a linear movement here. I mean, you could also keep this around, but we actually we actually need the linear movement here. It kind of sometimes looks weird where it's, where it's kind of like he's almost at this spot, but then like clicks into place. It's kind of weird, where it looks odd. So in order to have the linear movement, we have to add two more variables where we save the starting position of the offset, or fx, um, or first x, let's go osx, uh, offset starting, or sox, starting offset x, let's go starting offset x, socks, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so, um, so we, uh, when the animation starts, we set the starting offset and um, SOX and SOY, we set it to a value, to a starting value. And OX and OY is gonna be kind of like, what we calculate is the animation from going from zero, from the starting value to whatever value it sh should end up at. So, so here, we're just gonna go SOX and SOY. And here, we also, here's where we're setting the starting values. And then our update function will take care of the animation. So let me show you what, how this works. It didn't work. Let us debug this. What's, what's the problem here? I'm not sure why, why there's two lines. I, oh yeah, I, I, I um, So we see now it works. There's a bit of an issue where um, <clears throat> um, the offset is not being reset immediately. So it kind of like takes a, a one frame. I don't know if you see this in a, in a recording, but for one frame, um, the character is drawn at, the, at its destination, and then it takes one frame for it to catch up. So the way we can do this is we can uh, set the actual offset to the starting offset at the beginning. Something like this. So the OX and OY, they weren't updated fast enough and for one frame, because you know this update function here, um, that gets executed maybe after the character gets drawn on the screen. So um, this OX and OY during the animation is not being calculated fast enough. Not, uh, so you get one frame where we're gonna get our character displayed at a new position, but um, OX and OY aren't being calculated yet, so they're still at zero. And so our character for a one frame will appear at the destination. So in order to prevent this, we're gonna set the offset, offset Y and X, 
to its target value, to its starting value here when we press the button. So it never actually appears at its final destination um, until the animation has run its course. Cool. Why did we do this? Why did, why did it work before? It just works the same way as it did before. Well, the reason why we did this is now we can control the speed of the animation and also later on there's going to be other advantages. So for example, um, you know, this is one animation, but we can now plug in different animations. We can animate OX and OY differently. Um, for example, if we want to like bump, we don't want to do a bump against the wall. We can now do that. Um, so, but now also we can like use this here, this value, this is where we advance our animation timer. We can now make it go f twice as fast, you know. We can go, we can make it go really fast now, or 0 0.5, like very, very fast, you know. So this is how you can like choose how quickly this animation is being run. So I will pick a number. I picked this number. I think this is a good number. Or was it 25? Uh, yeah, I think that's a good number. Let's try how this looks. Uh, maybe a bit slow. Oh, right. I know why it's so slow. Haha, <laughs> that <laughs> it makes sense. Uh, one thing that was important here, the update function, I'm using the regular update function, but I think we can go update 60 here. So now it runs at 60 frames per second. That makes makes things look a bit more lively. And now also the animation here makes sense to why I had the 15 in the previous episode as something I figured out for my prototype. So we're gonna plug that 15 in here as well. Where was it again? For the animation of the uh, speed of the animation. So it's like, yeah. This this looks this feels familiar now. Yeah, that's good. So you can see you have like this really nice smooth animation between the frames, and um, and the characters being animated smoothly. Cool. I think this is something we discussed maybe in a previous tutorial where it's like update sixty is an update function that runs at sixty frames per second. The regular update is um, it runs at thirty frames per second. So if there is I think it will default. I'm not sure what happens when there's like two animations, where there's two update functions, but I think it's just going to use update 60 and that runs at 60 frames per second. Um, okay, so this is going to be it for today. Uh, we still haven't done that one thing where um, the character is supposed to flip direction when it moves in different directions. That's something we have to actually uh, implement next. And another thing I want to be doing is I want the character to actually collide with environment now. This is actually going to be now gameplay, where we're actually going to start um, making sprites that, you know, defining which sprites are walkable, which sprites aren't walkable, stuff like that. That's something going to be, that's going to be going to figure out on the next episode. See you next time around, guys. And as always, make sure to check out the code in down in the doobly-doo. Let me know if you have any questions. See you next time around.